check, audio check. Got me? One, two, one, two.
Distinguished guests, the President of the United States, accompanied by Colonel Paris Davis, U.S. Army, retired. The psalmist of old writes, Praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold, my deliverer, my shield, in whom I take refuge. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me as we mark this very special occasion in prayer. Almighty God, author of liberty and champion of the oppressed, I praise you for the life, heroic leadership, and distinctive service of your humble servant, Colonel Retired Paris D. Davis. Our Army has always counted on our leaders to be fully committed to our nation's ideals, to our Army values, and to all the soldiers under their command. Colonel Davis is a warrior leader who demonstrated what it looks like under the most challenging of conditions. We are humbled and inspired by Colonel Davis's example. In the moments that mattered most to those with him from the Operational Detachment Alpha, 321 5th Special Forces Group Airborne and the Army of the Republic of Vietnam 83rd Regional Force Company with him on that day of battle in 1965. Your servant displayed uncommon fortitude and courage and the willingness to sacrifice his own life to save others. The men under his charge looked to him for leadership and by your strength he delivered. As Colonel Davis rightly receives our nation's highest military award for valor in action, for distinguishing himself by acts of gallantry above and beyond the call of duty. I humbly ask that his legacy not be defined by this moment or the receiving of this medal, but may the legacy of this medal and the rich history it bears be further evidenced and enriched by the character, selflessness, and heroism of Colonel Davis. And may his life, which has been marked by a commitment to you and a sacred commitment to all that freedom-loving people cherish and hold dear, serve as a continued beacon of inspiration for all who witness today's activities and learn of his courageous actions under fire. Finally, may this ceremony serve as a testament of hope for the world's oppressed and as a terrible warning to the oppressor because our nation still has men and women like Colonel Davis in our ranks across our military services who stand ready to step into the breach. We thank you, O Lord, for this reality. It is in your most holy name I pray. Amen. Please all, please be seated. I have to say at the outset, I've had the great honor, and we have other Medal of Honor recipients here, and uh, that I've been able to give one of those medals. And uh, we have five here, but uh, this, uh, as Secretary, may be the most consequential day since I've been President. It's an incredible man. I, uh, 158 years ago today, in, the white, in this White House, President Lincoln was putting the final touches on his second inaugural address. And he wrote, let us strive to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds and care for him who shall have borne the battle. Today, 58 years after he bore the battle, we honor a true hero of our nation. Colonel Paris Davis. I've had a chance to get to talk to him a little bit. We talked on the phone, and he doesn't know if we're going to talk a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible guy. <clears throat> the Medal of Honor, created during Lincoln's presidency, is our country's highest military award recognizing gallantry above and beyond the call of duty. That word gallantry, it's not much used these days, gallantry. But 
I can think of no better word to describe Paris, to describe you. I really can't. Gallantry. And everyone here feels exactly the same way. That includes Secretary Austin and Secretary McDonough and Secretary of the Army Warmoth and the Vice Chairman Grady and, and General McC McConville, Representative Byer. Where's Representative Byer? Thank you. Thank you for pushing this a little bit. Appreciate it. For joining us today. Now, as many of you know, Paris will be the first to tell you that he hates the word I, that it was his team who served and his team who sacrificed. So today, I'm truly honored to welcome one of those teammates, Ron Deese. Dice, where's Ron? Ron. <laughs> he was the airborne spotter for that team. And uh, it was only a few days ago, right? <laughs> I also want to thank previous Medal of Honor recipients who are here who joined us to recognize uh, their brother in arms. Leroy Petrie, William Swenson, Melvin Morris, Matthew Williams, and Earl Pumley. Stand up. Guys. You're looking at courage in the flesh. And finally, uh, Greg and Stephanie Paris, uh, you already know this, but uh, your dad was a hero, but he didn't have to win this medal for you to know that. You knew it all along. You really did, didn't you, when you were a kid? You knew growing up. And, uh, you know, and like you, I wish your brother Christopher were still with us to see your dad's final re finally recognize his story. <clears throat> you know, it's a story that didn't just begin in the, Vietnam the Vietnamese village 58 years ago. Instead, picture Paris in 1956, the son of a Midwestern foundry worker, starting his uh, first year at Southern University in the heart of Louisiana. The college football team quickly noticed that Paris had the grit and the guts it needed on the team. So before long, Paris not only joined the team, but he's named All-American, the boys. He's a very slow learner, this guy. <laughs> I tell you what. But off the field, Paris saw constant reminders that too many, to many, he was less than an American. And that in the eyes of the law, he was less than a person. Signs on bars that read whites only. Seats on buses where were off limits for African Americans. School streets, shops divided by segregation. Paris endured all of this and still chose to join his college ROTC unit. Volunteering to serve a country that, in many places, still refused to serve people who looked like him. Right away, it was clear that Paris was a born warrior. He became an Army Ranger. Then he jumped at the chance to join the Green Berets, becoming one of the nation's first black Special Forces officers. Paris linked the, liked the Green Berets because uh, they were elite. It wasn't just, as Paris once said, Joe here, Joe there. By the way, it didn't offend me you said Joe here, Joe there. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that, that didn't bother me. But, but the Green Berets, like our country then, weren't free from discrimination either. People pulled Paris aside to warn him, are you sure you want to join? There aren't a lot of people like you who look like you in this outfit. Well, remember, this was only 14 years after President Truman desegregated our military, only 14 years later. But Paris didn't listen to them, and thank God he didn't. Paris helped write the history of our nation. And this year, we celebrate the 75th anniversary of our first fully integrated armed forces, and named Paris Davis will still stand alongside the nation's pioneering heroes. You know, in the early hours of June 18, 1965, and his uh, captain, then Captain Davis, and his team with three of the Green Berets were wrapping up a job well done. And together, they just finished a 10-mile march through the night to support a company of South Vietnamese soldiers on their first combat mission, a raid against the Viet Cong, thick in the jungle of Bong Song. The raid was a success. But as the sun began to rise, the men heard that haunting sound ring out, a bugle, a bugle, a sure sign of a counterattack. Within minutes, the jungle lit up with enemy fire. 
Hundreds of Viet Cong began to swarm Captain Davis and his team, pinning them down in a rice paddy with no cover. Captain Davis rallied his team to fight back, getting so close to the enemy he was battling them hand to hand. Hours, this is the part that stuns me, hours into that fight, Captain heard, suddenly heard a sound worse than the bugle, his teammate crying out for help. His team sergeant had been shot badly in his foot and his leg, trapping him in the middle of the paddy. And it got worse. On the far side of the field, his weapon specialist was stuck in a cesspit after being temporarily knocked out by shrapnel. You know, and even further beyond him was his medic, who had been shot in the head. Captain Davis realized he was the last American standing. Without hesitation, he yelled, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. He called in friendly fire and gave a little bit of cover to run out and rescue his team. On his first attempt to get to team sergeant, Captain Davis was shot in the arm and had to turn back. Captain Davis waited for another window and sprinted back out again. But his team sergeant was stuck. Captain Davis couldn't fully break him free before he had to return, had, had returned to cover. He didn't give up, though. That's not the Green Beret way. For his third time, as enemy fire rained down him, he ran out. Captain Davis freed his team sergeant, threw him over his shoulder, and started carrying up the hill to safety. Captain Davis got about halfway up the hill before a bullet pierced his leg. Then, in front of him, another Green Beret sergeant who had just arrived to the battle to reinforce the team was shot in the chest and now needed to be rescued as well. Captain Davis limped up the hill with his team sergeant on his shoulder. He'd been fighting for around 10 hours, but Captain Davis didn't hesitate. He went back down the hill to retrieve the reinforcement who had been just shot in the chest, all 240 pounds of him. Next, Captain Davis ran to his weapons specialist, who was struck in that cesspit. Viet Cong fighters continued to spray gunfire across the field as Captain Davis threw his teammate a rope, pulled him out, and began to haul him up the hill as well. But this time, the rescue helicopter, by this time, the rescue helicopter had landed. Captain Davis' commander gave him a direct order, get on board. Davis' response was just as direct. Sir, he said, I'm just not going to leave. I still have an American out there. Unsure if he was still alive, Captain Davis began to plan how he would get his medic. Just the day before, the medic had found out he was the good news. He was a new father. His wife had given birth to the first child. Captain Davis was going to give him a chance to see his baby boy. He pinpointed the medic's position and began crawling toward him, with gunfire and grenades still exploding around him. When he got there, the medic still alive asked him, am I going to die? Am I going to die? Captain Davis said, not before me. Still fending off the Viet Cong assailants, Captain Davis hauled his medic up the hill. And nearly 20 hours, nearly 20 hours later, after that bugle first rang, Captain Davis had, had saved each one of his fellow Americans, every single one. Just as the story of Paris Davis did not begin on June 18, 1965, it does not end there either. Captain Davis went on to become Colonel Davis, serving more than 25 years in our military and earning a PhD on top of that. He received the Civil Star, the Bronze Star, the Air Medal, the Purple Heart. And even after he hung up his uniform, the captain continued to serve the community, founding the Metro Herald, a newspaper that focused on his local community and civil rights issues. I wish I could say that this story of Paris' sacrifice on that day in, 19, in 1965 was fully recognized and rewarded immediately. But sadly, we know they weren't. At the time Captain Davis returned from war, the country was still battling segregation. Returned from Vietnam, Vietnam to experience some of his fellow soldiers crossing the other side of the street when they saw him in America. And although the men who were with him in that June day immediately nominated Captain Davis to receive the Medal of Honor, somehow the paper, the paperwork was never processed. 
not just once, but twice. But you know what Captain Davis said after learning he would finally receive the Medal of Honor? Quote, America was behind me. America was behind me. He never lost faith, which I find astounding. He never stopped believing in the founding vision of our nation, a vision that Lincoln kept alive 158 years ago, and a vision Paris fought to defend 58 years ago. This vision for a more perfect union, one where all women and men are created equal. You know, we're the most unique nation in the world. We're the only nation founded on an idea. Every other nation is founded based on philosophy, based on ethnicity, religion, whatever, an idea. It's captured in. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty. We've never fully lived up to it, but we've never walked away from it. This is evidence we're still not going to walk away from it. Look, folks, we never, ever walked away from our troops who dare all and give all to our nation. Paris, you are everything this medal means. I mean everything this medal means. And look, you're everything our generation aspired to be. You're everything our nation is at our best. Brave and big-hearted, determined and devoted, selfless and steadfast. American. American. And now, at long last, it's my great honor to ask Lieutenant Colonel Rowe to read the citation. President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, March 3, 1863, has awarded in the name of Congress the Medal of Honor to Captain Paris D. Davis, United States Army, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his own life above and beyond the call of duty. Captain Paris D. Davis, Commander, Detachment A321, 5th Special Forces Group, Airborne, 1st Special Forces, distinguished himself by acts of gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty while serving as an advisor to the 883rd Regional Force Company, Army of the Republic of Vietnam, during combat operations against an armed enemy in the vicinity of Vong Song, Republic of Vietnam, on June 17 through 18, 1965. Captain Davis and three other U.S. Special Forces advisors accompanied the Vietnamese 883rd Regional Force Company on its first combat mission, a daring nighttime raid against a Viet Cong regional headquarters housing a superior enemy force. Captain Davis' advice and leadership allowed the company to gain the tactical advantage, allowing it to surprise the unsuspecting enemy force and kill approximately 100 enemy soldiers. While returning from the successful raid, the regional force company was ambushed and sustained several casualties. Captain Davis consistently exposed himself to the hostile arm, small arms fire to rally the inexperienced and disorganized company. He expertly directed both art artillery and small arms fire, enabling other elements of the company to reach his position. Although wounded in the leg, he aided in the evacuation of other wounded men in his unit, but refused medical evacuation himself. Following the arrival of air support, Captain Davis directed artillery fire within 30 meters of his own position in an attempt to halt the enemy's advance. Then, with complete disregard for his own life, he braved intense enemy fire to cross an open field to rescue his seriously wounded and immobilized team sergeant. While carrying the sergeant up a hill to a position of relative safety, Captain Davis was again wounded by enemy fire. Despite two painful wounds, Captain Davis again refused medical evacuation remained with the troops, fought bravely, and provided pivotal leadership and inspiration to the regional force company as they repelled several Viet Cong assaults on their position over a period of several hours. When friendly reinforcements finally arrived, Captain Davis again refused medical evacuation until he had recovered an Air US advisor under his command who had been wounded during the initial ambush and presumed dead. 
While personally recovering the wounded soldier, he found him severely wounded but still clinging to life. Captain Davis directed the helicopter extraction of his wounded colleague, not leaving the battlefield himself until after all fr friendly forces were recovered or medically evacuated. Captain Davis' heroism and selflessness, above and beyond the call of duty at the risk of his own life, are in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Army. Ladies and gentlemen, please receive this benediction. Gracious and everlasting God, as we depart this ceremony, inspired by the courageous actions of Colonel Davis, help us to follow his selfless example as we serve our nation's people. May our participation in today's ceremony, coupled with the strengthening and shaping of your spirit to compel us to live lives of integrity and valor for the good of the nation, for the good of our families, and for the good of humankind around the world. Bless and protect our armed forces as they preserve our precious freedoms. Keep the lamp of liberty burning bright on the United States of America and our allies around the world. And grant us all your grace to meet the challenges ahead, the strength to overcome every obstacle, and impart to us the wisdom and the will to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before you all the days of our lives. It is in your most holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Distinguished guests, please remain in your seats as the president departs. Thank you.